Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about preserving and growing trade with the EU, brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade in association with Fujitsu. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for this afternoon. And thank you all for joining us today. This is clearly a topic of great importance to UK traders, and we already have uh, several hundred of you, in fact, on the call already with more to come. So a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, next slide, please. We have a panel of three very experienced and knowledgeable speakers today. Later on, we'll be hearing from Shankar Singham and Frank Dunsmuir. Uh, Shankar, as you can probably see on the slide, is the CEO of International Trade Law and Economic Policy Consultancy, Competer. He is a vastly experienced trade policy expert, having advised both the US Trade Representative and the Secretary of State for International Trade in the UK. And there are very few people who know more about using technological solutions to facilitate international trade than Frank, who is Head of International Trade and Customs at Fujitsu and a non-executive director at the International Border Management and Technology Association. But before we hear from Frank and Shankar, we will be listening intently as ever to Kevin Shakespeare, the head of the Institute of Export and International Trades Academy, who many of our regular listeners will know well, of course. So hi, Kevin, how are you today? How, how are things going your end? I'm good, Will. Thank you very much and hope you're well and hope everyone on the call is, uh, is well and safe. Thank you. Absolutely. I hope you are all well and safe as ever. As well as leading the Institute's provision of training courses and qualifications, Kevin is also a UN approved international trade trainer, the Dean of the UK Customs Academy, and has worked on several trade initiatives alongside governments and export agencies across the UK and internationally. On the next slide, though, before handing over to Kevin, I'd like to run just a couple of quick polls to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So this first part I'm going to launch. Just want to find out what kind of goods you trade. So the options there are standard or non-controlled goods, SBS goods, so these would be goods subject to sanitary or phytosanitary checks or controls, uh, and these may include products of animal origin or plant or plant products. Excise goods, uh, so this could be alcohol or tobacco goods, amongst others, which uh, incur excise duty. Controlled goods, so these would be goods requiring an export license, that could be military or dual use goods. And there's a none of the above option as well. While you are answering that poll, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions towards the end of the webinar, though please bear in mind we have already received a lot of questions in advance, so we'll not be able to get to everything today, but we'll, we'll try our best to get through as much as we can. If you feel as though your question has not been answered uh, at the end of the webinar, please do review some of the services we'll be talking about later in this webinar. Secondly, you will receive access to today's slide pack and a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. so please do try to listen in as carefully as you possibly can. There'll be plenty of good advice today, I am sure. So I'm just going to close this poll and share the results. So over 50% of you uh, are trading standard or non-controlled goods, possibly not surprised that. 11% uh, of you are trading SPS goods, only 3% excise goods, 15% controlled goods, and a fifth of you are none of the above. I'm gonna ask just a second poll quickly. And this one is asking you, uh, do you think your business is prepared to make declarations when the ease, current period of easement ends? So this is import declarations uh, into Great Britain from the EU. Options there range from yes, very prepared, yes, quite prepared, no, not very prepared, no, not at all prepared and not sure. Kevin, uh, just to bring you on while people are answering that poll, uh, any surprises on the first one? Uh, most people uh, exporting or trading standard goods. Yeah, so again, um, can I thank uh, everyone for completing the poll um, and, and obviously thank everyone for attending today. So yeah, it, interesting percentages there, I think in terms of the mix. So just over 50% standard, 11% SBS, and I guess 15% controlled goods, which 
which is interesting as well, which, which, which reinforces the fact, as we'll talk about today, some of the additional requirements around SBS and control goods. So quite interesting, thank you. And just referring to this question, I mean, we're going to be talking about it later on in the webinar, but uh, in terms of period of ease, easement, could you just give a quick one-liner for a few of the people who are not sure what that might mean? Yeah, so it, so when we refer, I guess, to 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 easements, first of all, is is that we can also consider them, if you like, as simplifications. But I think when we refer to it today, we 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 must consider in in the fact that these are easements uh, following um, uh, post transition period that are there to support businesses and to support supply chains. Uh, but it, but it is in uh, it, it is important to to bear in mind that these have a finite period. But also, as we're going to talk about today, there are requirements um, uh, to 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 access the easement. And then, when the easement period ends, which can vary in 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 terms of it being, for example, on the 25th of June, um, the um, uh, the 1st of October, the 1st of January next year. Um, that, that, that these easements do do mean a requirement for businesses. It doesn't mean that businesses do nothing, and, and that's something we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, that's a good explanation, and yeah, we'll be coming on to that all in more detail shortly, just to share the results of that poll. So, um, quite interesting again. So, 37% of you are quite prepared. 16% very prepared. Well done. That's that's great to hear. Uh, just under 20% not very prepared, 8% not at all prepared. So, uh, slightly more people feeling positive about things than not. But um, for those of you who are not sure, hopefully, we'll give you some more clarity throughout the course of this webinar. But if we move on to the next slide, um, thanks everyone again for answering those polls, much appreciated as, as, as ever, but enough of me, it's time to hand over to Kevin, so over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much again, Will. Um, so um, what we're going to uh, refer to today is, is we're going to look at changes in the trading rules that apply, and, and the emphasis is very much on the rules for GB EU trade, but more specifically in this instance for uh, exports in the EU and imports into Great Britain. So, so those are the key principles and the emphasis for, for today. Um, over the last year, the Institute have held um, uh, a number of webinars on the on the on the phased border operating model, uh, both the initial border operating model and the updated border operating model. Uh, and also recently, members of the Institute have taken uh, taken part in lunchtime learning sessions uh, in which the border operating model has, has also covered. So we're going to look at the key um, key changes today, but also the challenges and potential risks. Because like a lot of things on trade and customs, uh, it, it is about uh, trade compliance, but trade compliance has this link with trade facilitation. So effective supply chains and effective business op uh, uh, operations. So, so some of these changes and, and what's going on shouldn't always be seen as negative from a compliance perspective, it's also an opportunity to create a strong business culture as well. So we're going to look at the changes, what, what that means for you, for businesses, for individuals, and how to uh, how to pre prepare yourself. And, and can I say first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to share the platform today with Frank and Shanka. Uh, have had the opportunity and, and the pleasure of, uh, of, of, of working with both of them recently, uh, and, and it's great that we're able to share a platform today. And we'll have plenty of opportunity today to uh, to refer to questions and answers as well. So let's start by looking at the changes in EU to GB customs rules. Uh, and it's fair to say that we, we need to think about this in every in term of every movement, every time you submit a declaration, every time you import, these changes are required. So from the 1st of January, uh, effectively post-transition period, these changes were implemented. But if we think uh, pre-Brexit, so last year, um, uh, movement of goods uh, from the European Union to Great Britain, almost all goods moved were tariff-free. There were no checks at the border for most goods, and there were no customs requirements for goods. Uh, uh, for goods. So we could see the impact there, and clearly uh, post-transition period, we can see the changes here. So um, from the 1st of January, um, uh, there is the, uh, uh, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, 
which it may be possible to claim preferential um, zero tariff, but goods must meet the rules of origin requirements. We've talked a lot uh, uh, about rules of origin uh, and, and some of the requirements uh, uh, around goods satisfying rules of origin. And we need to think about rules of origin in this instance as the, as the, as the satisfying the EU rules of origin. So the goods are of EU origin. Uh, so they can meet the, um, the terms of the pre preferential trade deal. Because if they're not of EU origin, so for example, goods, um, uh, goods are sent from China to Germany to the Netherlands uh, as, 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 as part of a distribution business with no processing, then those goods are not of EU origin. So they would have duty and tariffs applied. Uh, there are checks at the border, and we're going to look at the phase border operating in, in, uh, model in that regard. And classically, for any borders globally, when there's checks at the border, that requires um, uh, certification and customs formalities, customs processes, uh, and also a requirement in some instances for physical checks as well. Now, as we know, or as, as, uh, and, uh, as we've talked about previously, under the border operating model, there is a phasing of some of these requirements. But phasing doesn't mean that businesses just do nothing. So all these changes have import have implications for your import journey. So goods you're, you are importing, purchasing from the European Union. You will need new documentation. And that documentation does uh, does uh, uh, differ in terms of its requirements from the date of import, as we're going to look at, and the types of goods. So in our question, we, we ask questions around SPS goods, sanitary, phytosanitary goods. Uh, we, we ask questions around controlled goods, dual use goods, for example, excise goods. And they all impact the type of documentation required. And your goods may face checks at the border. Uh, and again, that's impacted by both the date and the type of goods being imported. And you may need to pay um, a VAT and duty, um, uh, uh, and that's incurred after you have crossed the border. Yes, there is postponed VAT accounting, uh, and, and there is potential, uh, if duty is payable, to, to use a duty deferment account. So, um, so to remain compliant and avoid um, delays, um, you should businesses should take action, be prepared for the changes that are required, keep documentation, keep records. And, and that's also important, not just to remain compliant, but to have good customers and supplier relations. The best international trade, the best international business, ideally is where, it, where it's right first time. Happy customer, happy supplier, who is more prepared to, to, to work together going forward and have repeat business, which is always the best business. And customs and trade pays a, a, a fundamental uh, impact there. So now let's look at some of the dates. So, uh, and we must, we must stress here, it does include 25th of June, July 2021 are also key dates, notwithstanding changes to the original border operating model. So let's just uh, go through this. From the 1st of January, the start of easement period for standard goods, so non-controlled goods, uh, and supplementary declarations come into effect 175 days after the date of import. So for example, if you've imported the goods on the 1st of January itself, you have your first requirement for a supplementary declaration on the 25th of June. And thereafter, it's a rolling uh, 175 days. So if you imported goods on the 1st of February, the 1st of March, the requirement for the supplementary declaration is 175 days after the date of, uh, 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 of import. So, um, and then from the 1st of October, you, um, you have a requirement for pre-notification for products of animal origin certain animal byproducts and then um, uh, high risk food not of animal origin. So, so ne then we have this concept of pre-notification and in this case uh, for a new system which is called IPATS. So, um, uh, so for certain products you have to have this import pre-notification that is a requirement as well in addition to the customs declaration requirements. And then from the um, from the end of December, we have the end of the easement period. So from the 1st of January, frontier declarations are now required for all goods. 
So effectively, from the 1st of January 2022, frontier declarations are required for all goods. And also we can see here safety and security declarations are required as well, um, which is another requirement that businesses must take into account, the requirement for safety and security declarations for imports. Yes, you will work with your freight forwarder, your haulier in that regard. There will also be physical checks through border control posts for products of animal origin. And, uh, and then also pre-notification for imports, uh, for example, of low risk plants and plant products. And then uh, from the 1st uh, uh, of April, the requirement, uh, sorry, 1st of March, there'll be checks at border control posts for live animals and low risk plants. So we can see some of the actual changes that are actually required there. So um, now, looks, uh, now let's look at the process for, um, uh, for certain types of goods. I'm going to start with standard goods here. So with regard to standard goods, uh, the, the, the process of, of easement uh, of supplementary declaration, what businesses should be doing is what's called EIDR, so an entry in declarance records. And it's very important for any imports that you, that you have, uh, whether it's before the 1st of July, after the 1st of July, before the end of this year, uh, that there is effectively uh, this requirement to enter the records and have the records available. So businesses should make sure they have the commercial invoice, the packing list, for example, pro forma invoices, and all the necessary information that's on there, the likes of commodity codes, gross net weight, etc. So it's very important that businesses have that information because that information will be needed for the supplementary declaration. And then to make the supplementary declaration, if a business were to do it themselves, they would have to be authorized for a process called CFSP, Customs Freight Simplified Procedures. And that's a that's a big, a, a, a big issue. Businesses can apply for CFSP, and I'm conscious that some businesses will, will have authorization, but for other businesses, a process that you have to go through. Um, so, which is why in some cases, you'll be looking to use the services uh, 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 of a third party and intermediary, for example. So um, non-controlled goods may enter under EIDR processes with the supplementary declarations we said are rolling um, 175 days uh, until uh, the beginning of January 2022. So we can see this, this element here that maybe a lot of goods have been brought in, into Great Britain uh, already. Uh, there is this requirement to keep records because those records are required for the supplementary declaration. So there's a requirement for that supplementary de uh, declaration that's needed. And if a business is gonna do it themselves, they need to have that CFSP authorization. Um, so, so, and, um, so effectively, we've got this big impact here that's required. Um, clearly, there is the option for some businesses to, um, if you want to make full frontier declarations for non-controlled goods. Okay, so some of the key takeaways, and bearing in mind we have over 50% 50, uh, uh, 50 of, of, uh, of the attendees today uh, are involved in standard goods. So goods classified as EU union status goods, not subject to controls, may enter GB, as we said, standard goods, uh, uh, which are EU, EU, EU status, uh, union status, may enter without frontier declarations and supplementary declarations are required for those imported goods within 175 days of the date of entry import. And um, as, as Frank and Shanker will talk about, we have been involved in developing a simple to use platform for traders to lodge these supplementary declarations. So recognizing the, the, the importance and the need to support businesses. OK, let's look at controlled goods now. So with controlled goods, there will be uh, uh, additions, additional certificates and licenses required. Uh, and an example we've referred to there is CITI, so uh, around the international trade uh, uh, in, in endangered species, will require additional certification if it's controlled goods. Uh, and within the border operating model, there is a list of, 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 of the definition of what is meant by control goods. So there will be a requirement for the import de de declaration. There will be requirement for the entry safety and security declaration as well. 
So as we've indicated, this requirement for the safety and security declaration in addition to the import declaration. And in some cases, there will be a requirement for a GVMS entry as well. And that will depend on, on the port of entry and, 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 and whether the port uses, if it's an inventory linked port, use, uses the uh, uh, inventory linked functionality that the port has. So we can see the additional requirements here, which move which businesses need to consider, which move beyond just the, just the import declaration to the entry safety and security, and in some cases the G, uh, GVMS entry as well. And then we have um, SPS goods. So SPS goods um, uh, re require additional documentation. So in, uh, requirement for export health certificates and the CHED, the Common Health Entry document as well. Uh, and if it's, for example, plants, it will require a uh, phytosanitary uh, certificate from the Animal Plant and Health um, uh, Authority. So we can see additional requirements depending on the actual types of goods involved. And additionally, we have the import pre-notification required as well in, in line with the phasing, which we went through earlier. So it's very important to recognize the phasing of when things are required. And again, the support that we're providing through the digital trader services uh, and, and the customs expertise and trade expertise is fundamental in that regard. So again, we can see import, safety and security and, and, and GVMS where required. Or where appropriate. And then we have excise goods. So, uh, uh, so effectively, we then have EAD, the electronic administrative uh, document that comes into play as well. So effectively, uh, and in a lot of cases, excise goods may move under duty suspension, for example, uh, in, into a bonded warehouse. So again, we can see the requirements. So different requirements depending on the actual nature of the goods being moved. And, and it's fair to say excise goods uh, that, uh, that declarations uh, have been required since January 2021 for imported goods. Uh, and whilst we're predominantly looking at imports today, we thought we'd put this slide in, in place and these slides will be available to you with regard to the GBEU export process. And in, in the context of, of movements, we also have to consider the importance of transit as well. So goods, for example, moving through France to Germany, for example, or Spain. So that transit will also be a fundamental important requirement that traders, freight forwarders, hauliers will be aware of as well. Okay, so let's just sort of summarize. We're going to pass to Frank shortly and think about the main challenges that businesses, traders face. And what, and not just businesses, traders, what the whole industry faces at the moment is that there has been clearly visibility of, of the border operating model. But if you're, but clearly for businesses, you've got a business to run. You've got a lot of things to think about as well. Uh, there could be, and there will be, a large backlog of supplementary declarations. So the clock starts tick, uh, ticking from the 25th of June. So, and then we have the 175 roll-in deadline thereafter. So there could be a, a very large backlog of declarations that require to be submitted. We think for nearly six months, uh, 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 there hasn't been a requirement for standard goods for declarations to be made when goods have entered Great Britain. And, and on top of that, we have a lack of familiarity with new customs processes. We've heard a lot about GB2EU and, and some of the issues around export in there. That has predominantly been the focus, but imports will now very much come into focus. And, and the requirements for import declarations and the number of fields is more complex than an export. So there's additional requirements that businesses have to use and understand. Uh, and, and also trying to get things at high prices, or uh, so trying to get things at an, uh, an affordable price could be difficult as well. So uh, in addition to businesses having, having to catch up with a backlog of imported goods, the industry having to catch up, potential lack of familiarity and, and, and expertise in these areas, uh, th there could obviously be increases in prices as well. Uh, and also there's the element of CFSP, Customs Freight Simplified Procedures. If a business wants to do it themselves, they've effectively got to apply uh, and become authorised for, for CFSP, which, which, which cannot be done overnight either. So potential risks for your business. 
Um, it's not just about knowing what to do and it's not just about doing it, it has to be done correctly. And trading history is considered, is recorded by HMRC. So it's not just about what happens on the 1st of July, the 1st of November, the 1st of January next year. It's also about audit as well. So the requirement for accuracy for audit, for both customs audit and VAT audits as well, becomes really important. So compliance accuracy uh, clearly becomes very important. And when we think about a customs declaration, it's not just a, a, a paperwork. You have to get things correct in the customs declaration, the commodity code, the valuation of goods for customs purposes, the origin of the goods, <clears throat> and so on. So it's very important that the accuracy and not just not just putting information in, which might not be uh, uh, accurate. So there could be impacts in compliance, but also higher costs for businesses as well, and potential delays, um, uh, which as we've seen for some, uh, some products like SPS control goods, <coughs> excuse me, with additional certification, could impact the business as well. So what are practical steps to, to prepare? So let's go through these. Establish your sales and commercial arrangements. The importance of INCO terms, which you talked around a lot, uh, and having good invoicing procedures, retention of quotations, pro forma invoices, commercial invoices becomes key. Um, uh, set up a duty deferment account and register for, for VAT if necessary also become very important. So um, uh, will, will a duty deferment account, those of you traded with the rest of the world will be um, outside the EU previously will be familiar with the requirements, but for a lot of businesses there may be a requirement here to set up a duty deferment account. <coughs> Prepare to trade by getting the GB EORI number. Now we've asked a question previously who has EORI numbers. Um, an EU EORI number is only required under certain INCO terms. So uh, in, in this case, if you're importing under EXWX works, um, but in, in, in a lot of cases, it might be DAP delivered at place, which is used for EU movements, possibly FCA, uh, if, 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 uh, if you're responsible for collecting the goods. <coughs> And check to see if your goods are eligible for the simplified declarations process. Are they standard goods? So in terms of goods movements, ensure you have cleared any supplementary backlog. It's very important that you close out, that you have the records for any imported goods that your business um, uh, has, been, has been involved in importing and received uh, from the 1st of January. If the importer is VAT registered, you can use postponed VAT accounting, which is an, another easement. And postponed VAT accounting applies to imports, not just from the EU, uh, from the rest of the world as well. So at this stage, I'm going to pass over to, to Frank to talk through a few slides. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, setting the scene there, Kevin's really um, explained the, the changes that are coming into effect. Um, or have come into effect from January, and how those changes will um, further develop through the course of the year. Uh, so moving goods from the EU into, into the UK uh, and, and back the other way will now require uh, new customs procedures. So I've got three slides to go through, which are uh, really, first of all, looking at, um, at some of the options that the businesses have uh, in three broad categories for handling those uh, customs administration. Um, we did a, a poll, uh, a number of polls um, across a broad reach of industry, uh, and I'll share some of those results in terms of what um, industry readiness looks like and some of the key challenges uh, that industry are looking um, are, are facing at the moment in managing those customs uh, facilities. Uh, and then thirdly, just position the digital trader service, um, how that fits into the picture and the sort of service that we're building uh, to meet demand in this space. So first of all. Uh, how are organisations, what are the options to approach um, uh, meeting the customs administration requirements? First, uh, the first option is, is pretty much the in-house option. So particularly for larger companies uh, and companies with existing capabilities, you may be trading with the rest of the world already, familiar with customs, uh, and you may be able to expand or use that team um, to access uh, the, the, the um, customs platforms and chief databases. Uh, to create your own customs declarations in-house. Um, we put that down 
on the left hand side there is a lower cost option because it's it's typically just a small expansion of what you have uh, already um, so uh, some organizations may be in that in that in that um, in that position uh, in the middle uh, we we placed digital trader services which i'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment um, but essentially that's that's a middle ground uh, product where uh, for for organizations that don't have the benefit of um, larger in-house uh, customs expertise and capabilities and software etc this is an easy to use digital platform uh, written in english rather than in custom speak uh, and enables you to um, submit your declarations in a in a, 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 a more, much more simplified manner um, rather than using customs jargon etc um, it also provides access to uh, to expert help uh, and support uh, for for those of you that that in particularly in the early stages where you need clarification on procedures and uh, new processes to get familiar with. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'm sure we're familiar with the Customs Intermediary Service, um, which uh, provides a very valuable function uh, to industry. Um, uh, and it's it's been supporting trade, uh, Great Britain trade with the rest of the world, uh, UK trade with the rest of the world until, until Brexit came along and it's now inundated with uh, a community that's inundated with um, additional volumes and demands for custom services uh, for trade with the EU. And to put that into proportion, uh, prior to the um, Brexit, we were we were looking at something like 50 million declarations a year uh, made in the UK, uh, and that could rise to anything from two, three, or even 400 million declarations a year as we uh, as the EU uh, um, requirements. Um, mature and fall into place through the, through the course of a year so that there is a market that needs to expand rapidly in order to fill that gap uh, and there will be a gap it's highly likely there will not be enough customs intermediaries to support that um, that requirement and, and serve that market in total um, but many organizations have reached out to intermediaries today um, and hopefully they found intermediaries they're happy with and are starting to plan and prepare um, their requirements with, with their intermediaries uh, going forward. But there is a gap um, where, as, as we heard from the, um, the poll at the beginning, um, some 50 or 60 percent of attendees on this, this particular panel uh, today, uh, this particular seminar today, are not ready yet. So, so we're aware there is a, a gap in that market. And on the next slide, um, a little bit about the key challenges, just to reinforce what what Kevin was saying, that we, we did um, a couple of polls across a, a broad range of um, uh, GB industry um, who trade with the EU. Uh, and we did find actually remarkably similar um, numbers that, that we saw today, around about 60% not ready or not sure uh, about what they need to be doing. So in, in terms of key challenges facing it, we, we, we highlighted three categories. The first one is there's a backlog of supplementary declarations. Um, in order to put that into perspective, uh, what that really means is goods are coming into the UK from the EU. So traders are, are, are buying product and it's arriving by DHL or whatever carrier you may have. Um, and it's arriving in your premises in many instances without a declaration. Now, hopefully those are uh, goods that qualify under the easement. So they're not controlled goods, et cetera. And they're allowed to come in. And you're keeping records in the nice D-ring folder or on your financial systems of those transactions as they're entering the country. Um, and the process as we as we head towards the 175 day uh, easement period is you need to start converting those ship shipments into a declaration, which we call a supplementary declaration to say this arrived on the 5th, this arrived on the 6th of January, etc. And, and create declarations for those. So that backlog is quite significant for some organizations. Um, and they need a route to market in order to find out how to create those declarations. Uh, the second one is familiarity with new customs procedures. Um, and for those of you not familiar with customs procedures, you've probably heard some jargon already on this call where you, you may be scratching your head. Um, it is a complex world, um, lots of acronyms, and, and the procedures can be um, quite involved depending on the type of product and the type of process um, you're following. So, for example, uh, if you're bringing the goods in to actually manufacture something, you might be using inward processing. It, it's a, a customs procedure, uh, and each of those procedures needs to be um, understood and followed uh, and, and uh, adhered to in order to, to get the benefit of that particular procedure. 
So organizations need help with understanding what's the best customs procedure for my business, how do I optimize my supply chain, manage my costs and, and protect my business in that regard. Uh, and the third one is unexpected high prices. Um, another way of looking at that is customs admin is a new, um, a new administrative process for many organizations. Before this, you were trading with the EU without customs administration. Now you have to create some, uh, do some customs administration. So you're, you're creating declarations, managing records, uh, and there is a cost to that, whether it's an internal cost, um, some of your um, staff are now allocated to, to, to providing that, that function, or whether you're going out to the market um, and looking at intermediaries or um, agencies to actually provide those declarations for you. And demand is outstripping supply in the market, and we are absolutely seeing prices uh, increasing uh, in the marketplace at the moment for, for um, declaration services. So that has surprised an awful lot of organizations as well. And lastly, um, just positioning the digital trader service around those three areas. Um, thank you. So first of all, on the backlog, um, the digital trader service really is looking at trying to address each of those key priorities. So on the backlog, um, there, there are a number of ways we can help you with the backlog on digital trader services. So first of all, it can be um, entering if there, are, if there are not huge volumes of transactions, you can key them into a friendly user, user-friendly portal. So a bit like submitting your VAT return uh, at the end of the year. Uh, I mean, personal VAT, for example, on the um, uh, you know the UK portal. So it's that kind of user-friendly um, front end with, without lots of customs jargon, enabling you to transfer your shipment note or your invoice delivery note into a declaration and it, it'll process that for you. If you've got lots of um, items on your on your uh, shipments, then you might have those on the spreadsheet and we'll, we'll offer you the ability to upload that spreadsheet into the system as well. So you can automate the process uh, much more efficiently. And then finally, for those with more sophistication uh, or higher levels of sophistication, you can use what we call an API process where your IT department will actually build an interface in, into our service and that will move lots, lots of records in um, without you having to, to manually enter any information. Um, the second one is familiarity with customs procedures. Um, so we do have a, a contact center and we do have expert advice on hand um, to help you get familiar with what needs to be done, get your um, processes in order, uh, and help you get your data ready. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, there are um, checks and balances you need to be start, start thinking about now if you haven't already. So you may have a shipping note and goods listed on there, but do you have commodity codes, for example? Have they been classified yet? So there are um, preparations that you need to uh, take now and we can help you with those. And there, is, there are training modules and videos um, in order to help familiarize you with the, uh, the customs processes that are required. Uh, and finally, on the unexpected high costs or the uh, administrative costs of, of customs procedures, um, we're looking at a digital service, so as much self-service and automation as possible to reduce the price point uh, for creating declarations to um, as, uh, as less impactful as possible um, so that businesses get more value um, from that service. So I hope that's given you a, a, a flavour of the, the DTS. Um, I can hand it back to uh, William. Thank you, Frank. And if we move on to the next slide. Yes, thank you, Frank and Kevin, both for really good presentations. They're really interesting information there. As noted, we're going to do just a quick poll before we go into the Q&A. And um, this is a repeat of the poll we asked earlier. Um, we just want to engage how prepared you feel now um, regarding making declarations when the period of easements ends. And the options there are, again, very prepared to not at all prepared, but we've also invite you to say if you'd like to find out more information about what we've discussed so far today. Um, while people are answering that poll, uh, my delight to, to welcome Shankar on uh, to answer a few a couple of questions and then we'll open the, the questions to, to all three panelists. But Shankar, we've had a, a loads of really good questions. One from Lucy, which really sums it up. Lucy's asking, could you tell us a little bit more about how the service came into being and what are you trying to achieve with it? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, thanks very much. Um, 
uh, you know, first of all, it, it's great to be, uh, you know, on a panel again with with Frank and uh, and, and Kevin. Um, it's just uh, great, great to work together. I really echo Kevin's um, uh, sentiments at the beginning. Um, it, how this service sort of came into being? Um, obviously, you know, I suppose the, the major thing is that you, you don't have a, a, a country leaving a customs union every day. Um, it, it is a very unusual uh, occurrence and it creates complications. And the first complication is what tends to happen in the customs union is you get very, very integrated supply chains. So there is a very integrated supply chain between the UK and the EU. Um, that obviously hasn't changed just because the UK has left uh, left the EU customs union. But the the imposition of full customs processes, as the UK now has a free trade agreement uh, relationship with the EU, um, uh, means that both in terms of cost and complexity, um, you have some very major very major issues uh, to deal with. And I think we were challenged um, uh, to think about. Um, how do we resolve those issues? How do you, uh, without imposing exactly the same sort of customs process as would occur, you know, in trade between the UK and the rest of the world, uh, on this very integrated supply chain with goods that are moving back and forth between the UK and the EU on a sort of regular basis? So the first uh, element was, what could we do in terms of new technology? Uh, customs border management processes tend to be um, uh, you know, fairly, um, you know, they, they haven't really changed very much. They haven't really incorporated a lot of uh, new technology and new ideas uh, of how to do these things. Uh, the border has increasingly become more of a line, more of a series of transactions rather than a, than a line on a map. Uh, and yet customs is really focused on the line on the map. So how can we, how can we, how can we develop that? Uh, further and make it easier for, for traders to do this. And then we focused very much as a result of these um, poll questions that we that we commissioned um, uh, on the areas where we think there is a big gap. Um, and certainly there are two sort of a, at either ends of the spectrum. One is what can you do to create a digital first kind of platform that, that traders are able to use very easily using intuitive questions, uh, some of the technology that Frank and his team at Fujitsu have been able to put together. Um, what can you do to sort of really make the process easier and therefore obviously cheaper and less complex for, 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 for traders? And secondly, um, uh, how do we deal with the education gap? Because this is an evolving process. You know, obviously you've got the border operating model, you've got the phased UK border, all of this is changing. You've got multiple easements coming to uh, an end at different times. Uh, how can we solve the knowledge uh, gap? And that's why we were delighted to partner with the Institute of Exports, who, um, you know, who, who are premier uh, on, on education of, of, of traders uh, to, cover these, to cover these things. Um, and then we sort of looked at what is the, you know, what is the most important, most difficult thing that's going to hit us right now, and that is the, the supplementary declaration backlog. So what can we do about, uh, about solving that problem? Because it's just very clear that uh, what we cannot do as a sort of, you know, in, in terms of UK PLC, if you like, is just impose the standard process um, on. Uh, on these very integrated supply chains, uh, and that's the that's the whole focus of uh, digital trader service services. So, um, you know that that's the plan um, with, with with DTS, and we're we're, we're delighted to uh, be able to 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 unveil it and work with traders to ensure that they can have their uh, their problems sort of um, you know uh, dealt with uh, as we go forward in the in the most efficient manner that we can that we can come up with and. I think this also flows into uh, the UK government's uh, making a virtue out of a necessity and, and you know, plans to have you know, the best border in the world by, by 2025. If you plan to have the best border in the world by 2025, you really need to look under every rock in terms of what can you do to simplify these processes? What can you do to ensure um, uh, trade is as facilitated as possible? Thank you, Shankar. Um, if I just quickly share the results of that poll, that's really useful. We have a couple of questions which have come off the back of that answer, so I will uh, 
get onto those other questions shortly. Just to uh, share with everyone the results. Interesting, some movements. So people do feel, I think, a little bit more prepared having come to this webinar. So that's always encouraging um, and less people feeling unsure as well. Um, so 40% quite prepared, 17% very prepared, and then around uh, uh, over, oh God, my maths is completely gone. 42% uh, of 32% are feeling not very prepared and the remainder not prepared at all. So that was a painful maths there. Anyway, I'll close that poll if we can move on to the slide just with a panelist information. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll continue going through your questions. So uh, just a couple of questions just on, the, on the back of that, Shankar, on DTS. Andrew's unsurprisingly asked, what are the approximate costs of the DTS and at its different levels? And is it based on per license per user? And uh, Susan, uh, has also asked, is it Susan? No, sorry, it's Jonathan has asked, would a company use DTS instead of the trader support service? So, so in terms of in terms of costs, um, uh, obviously we 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 have um, multiple sort of you know variants in terms of the cost discussion, and I'm, I'm gonna uh, also get Frank to sort of come in on this as well. But basically, um, we'll have uh, you know it'll be it, it isn't a one size fits all. It's not going to be exactly the same for you know any type of trader. There, there are going to be certain traders who have very specific uh, requirements, and and the cost will be um, you know will reflect. Will reflect that, but I mean, our focus is to get is, is to make sure that this is as competitive as po as as possible, and recognises, as I said before, um, that um, that this is a service that uh, is is needed because we cannot simply impose the normal um, customs compliance costs of you know X number of pounds per declaration on 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 this very highly integrated supply chain. I don't know, Frank, if you want to um, say anything more about, um, about cost. Yeah, um, there's a couple of things. So we, we are working out and finalising the, the cost structures. Um, it's likely to be more around a transactional um, basis. So how many declarations will you do? Um, and, and that would include the, the, the support and, and education costs, et cetera. Um, for, for more sophisticated users heading towards what we call the API side, so we're integrating with your supply chain, um, they tend to be more bespoke solutions, uh, and that will be a question of sitting down with those organisations to work that through. But we're aiming to be um, at lower than market rate on the uh, per declaration costs for for traders, uh, because you're obviously doing some of the work yourself. You're you know you're you're providing either the spreadsheet or the data input. So uh, I think the best thing to do on that is um, th there will be a registration portal open on Monday, um, which is digitaltraderservices.com. Uh, and, and if you register on that to keep keep up to date with information, that would be ideal. Um, and we'll be putting um, uh, you know, various information about the development of the, um, the you know, border easements and, and customs developments on that on that portal as we go along as well. So it's a good place to 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 keep in touch with us. Um, somebody mentioned TSS a moment ago. This is separate to TSS. The Trader Support Service is government funded. Um, it provides a free to use service for declarations and, um, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This is this is Fujitsu and its consortium um, developed out of its own investment. Uh, it will be a chargeable service to industry, so we, we have to earn the right to have your custom uh, and provide a seamless you know, value, uh, to, valuable service for you to use. Um, and it's, it's for trade between Great Britain and the EU, as opposed to GB in Northern Ireland, which is a a different type of protocol for want to a better expression. Hopefully that, that answers that question. And and I would add one thing on, on, on costs as, as as Frank mentioned. I mean one of the reasons we're we're doing this is because of a recognition of a lack of capacity in the market to service traders and uh, lots of traders telling us in our polling that um uh, they, they they couldn't find uh, people who would do their, their their declarations, and therefore, obviously, when there's a lack of capacity, you've got an escalation in cost. So it's a sort of perfect storm of you know a lot of people needing the service and costs going up in ways that are not um, uh, not going to uh, satisfy uh, traders and and could have a real impact on the ability of those traders to trade. So so our cost structure is very much based, you know, with 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 that in mind. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, we had a question as well on DTS uh, from Susan, who's asked, can we use DTS if goods are imported through uh, an FPO? So that's a fast parcel operator. 
Uh, uh, yes, you can. Um, increasingly, what we're seeing is FPOs are, and this depends on the FPO, so this is not blanket uh, at all. Um, they're aware of the, the added complexity of, of customs processes now, uh, and a lot of them are moving towards DAP uh, type inco terms, which means, uh, yes, we'll carry your parcels and your goods, etc., but you've got to have a, a declaration before we load those goods and transport them for you. Now, I, I obviously, that is not a blanket statement. It must be absolutely crystal clear. That's not what DHL and all the rest of it are absolutely saying. Uh, um, you know, it was a blanket statement, but increasingly, lots of parcel operators are um, asking their, their customers to, to, to provide the declaration on their behalf. Um, I have a number of instances of uh, organizations I've been talking to around the DTS and I said I've got this pile of stuff and when I leafed through it, it, it was um, DHL type uh, deliveries and statements um, that they now have to create de declarations for. So yes, you can use it for that. If that I, I'm hoping that answers that question. I believe so and uh, Susan, do feel free to get in touch if you have any further queries. The point there, let me know. Um, I'm going to just move move on to some of the earlier uh, questions on some of the early things which Kevin was mentioning, and I wonder if Kevin is able to come back for this. So we have, we have a question from Dale, which is really fundamental to all of this. So he asks, what are the benefits in using entry and declarations record or customs freight simplified procedures? This requires a simplified entry followed by a full declaration. Surely it must be easier to complete just one full declaration at the frontier. So could you speak through some of the, the benefits there of the, these processes, Kevin? Yeah, so I guess there's a sort of couple of ways of, of looking at this, and, and thank you very much for the question. So we obviously refer to to entry into declarants records in 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 the context of, of the uh, of, of of the GB phase border operating model. If we think about the wider aspects of of, of CFSP customs rate simplified procedures, uh, I, I, I I guess a couple of ways of looking at it. One is it can expedite customs clearance. So uh, there's less fields to complete um, uh, in a in a in a in a in a, in a uh, uh, simplified declaration than in a full frontier declaration. So that's one way to expediting customs clearance. Uh, um, so that's probably one way of looking at it there, and, and especially using expedited customs clearance potentially of using it with a customs special procedure as well, such as customs warehousing. So that, that that's probably one of you know, one of the strong ways of looking at it. Uh, and also bearing in mind in that there are additional fields required for, for, for importing. Some businesses may choose to make a full frontier declaration and, and that's very much their, their prerogative, but uh, there is this, uh, this element of using CFSP for the expedited customs clearance and possibly using it with further customs procedures. And I think thinking about that, thinking about trade practice, is is that if you are receiving certain customs authorizations, um, you 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 will you potentially be audited. You have to demonstrate um, 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 <clears throat> uh, conformity, written procedures, and, and and good customs procedures. Is that you can consider additional customs procedures in addition to CFSP? Can I just add on to that as well? Um, thank you, Kevin. The um, to use CFSP, the simplified. Uh, frontier um, declaration. Kevin's absolutely right. It, it it can help expedite the movement of goods. At the moment, you don't even need a simplified frontier declaration for most goods coming into the UK, which is even simpler, isn't it? Um, what we, what we've also seen though is, first of all, you you do need to be authorised to use CFSP. So you've got to register before you can use that process. Um, now, doesn't mean you, you, you don't need to register today in order to to use the current easement. But when you make your supplementary declaration you'll need to be CFSP authorised. Um, but, but what we've noticed in, um, in our experience is the, the two-stage process of simplified followed by a front, um, supplementary declaration later is that, that you do need to match those two. So when you make your supplementary declaration, you've got to find the corresponding supplementary declaration and invoices and details. So the two-stage procedure does have some overheads. Um, there's a lot of interest, I would say, in my... Um, conversations at the moment to move towards frontier declarations. So that's where I'm seeing the, um, the, the focus move from, from a lot of traders at the moment. So my expectation um, is that most traders will move towards full frontier declaration uh, for their trade with, with the EU. And that, that's purely anecdotal and uh, <laughs> not, not, not scientific. Um, but I don't know if you've seen that as well, Kevin, but um, I, I think it's fair to say, and, and obviously, 
um, uh, clearly from the 1st of January next year, there's a, there's a requirement for for uh, for full frontier declarations. So certainly, as you say, uh, a, a number of companies are mentioned in that. I think also we have to consider the actual nature of the goods. So clearly, uh, if uh, uh, SPS goods, for example, uh, th there are potential benefits, of, especially of using CFSP. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Kevin and Frank. But uh, yeah, Kevin and Frank there. Quick last question, and I'll put this to Shanka. Um, so obviously we've spoken a lot about frontier declarations, um, but Joanna's asked if we could say a little bit more about entry safety and security declarations. And we've had a few various questions around kind of the, the different certificates and licenses which now be involved uh, with imports from the EU. I just wonder if you can touch again just on uh, to what extent ETS will be supporting any of those declarations and where people can find support for those aspects of import yeah so um uh you know i want once, once the easements go you you will have them under the phased uh, you know border right now you don't have to worry about um uh entry summary declarations into into the into gb um uh, there will be there are now two separate um security zones gb and 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 the eu and therefore entry summary declarations will be needed um uh, and so um uh, what what we are planning to do is to make sure that the traders are, are are supported in 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 making those in making those declarations um uh, but right now the, the the primary focus for the first um sort of round uh, of dts is to tackle the easement itself so so the easement as has been said in the in the in the present presentation is um very specifically turning those uh in turning your records into um, supplementary declarations that could be filed in a timely fashion. And so uh, what we're really, really focused on is creating the kind of um, uh, ingestion engine, if you will, that can take all of that data um, from your records and turn that into a supplementary declaration and make that um, uh, easy for, 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 for you to do. And I think there was a question also about licenses and uh, certifications and so on. So uh, what we are again focused on is the eu to gb um, piece of the movement so obviously there are easements with respect to sps uh, regulatory issues and, and 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 so on that expire at different periods um in 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 the year um we are looking at how we will support that in in further iterations of the of the dts model um uh, and of course that depends on on what the uk's approach um to those uh, regulatory requirements um, are. Thank you, Shanko. I think we've run out of time with questions, but I believe, Kevin, you have a couple more slides uh, just to share about the DTS and some IRE support as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much indeed. So, um, so um, again, thank you very much for everybody's question. So, uh, just a couple of slides to finish uh, around the Institute of Export and International Trade. So, um, the Institute's um, uh, uh, certainly has been established since 1935, and we now have a, a fast growing membership base of now 4,700 members uh, of both corporate and individual. And we're very much focused on boosting and enhancing the, the UK's. Uh, export performance, but also in the context of today, the impact of supply chain importing becomes really, really important in that regard. So all the key elements uh, the Institute are involved in, in terms of export, import, supply chain, uh, 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 logistics, customs, uh, and, and so on. Um, in terms of supporting businesses, we've seen a huge growth in our um, in our um, helpline and our, our uh, real time support we provide for businesses. So for, for our business members, uh, access to a helpline. Uh, we provide educational pro programs to professionalize individuals and, and the businesses themselves. And we also offer consultancy and business support services as well, as well as business networking opportunities. And we're very keen in, uh, in terms of policy and leading policy in, uh, in, in everything related to international trade, export, supply chain, logistics, etc. So uh, we're heavily involved with government in, in, in several initiatives. Um, <clears throat> In terms of uh, is, um, uh, individual members, we, we, we have a, a suite of um, educational qualifications which are regulated. Let me get the slide back here. Um, 
and um, uh, we provide CPD programs as well as short courses as well for individuals as well as uh, bespoke and in-house business training courses. Um, and uh, that we will be offering a combined institute, IRE, uh, Institute of Export and International Trade membership with the Digital Trader Service as well. So uh, on that note, I will pass back to, uh, to Will. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, just while uh, as people are leaving, I'll just ask this question uh, just so we can find out a little bit more about how you're feeling about all of this. So we're just asking, are you interested in hearing more about a combined IUE membership and digital trader services offer? Uh, the options are yes, I'd like to know more or no, thank you. Um, just while you're answering that poll, uh, just going to basically wrap up for, for today. So thank you once again to to Kevin, Shankar and Frank for your advice and time today. Really appreciate it. I hope everyone has found this session really useful. Uh, just a reminder, we will be sending all registrants a recording of today's webinar, along with a copy of the slides over the next couple of days. Uh, but for now, please do take the poll uh, as you leave. We've also got an exit survey where you can let us know your thoughts about today's webinar. Um, but yeah, I'll leave this open for just a little bit longer while you're answering that poll and uh, I'll close it in about 30 seconds or so. But uh, for me, for me and the gang, I suppose, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending.